Today we're going to go over the first 30 days in Linux and what to expect. I've done an entire documentary of my first 30 days. It's by far the most popular playlist on this channel. So if you want to see my 30 days, but I at least wanted to kind of give a broad overview of what you should expect when it comes to uh, the first 30 days in Linux without having to watch, you know, literally uh, two hours worth of me hacking around in Linux and those types of things when I first got started on this channel. So with that, let's Let's uh, go ahead and jump into it. This video is brought to you by Private Internet Access, one of the only no-log VPN services that have been proven in court. I've personally used them for the past four years, and I highly recommend them. I've never had any issues in that four years and why I recommend them exclusively on this channel. So right out of the gate, you want to go ahead and try Linux desktop because for whatever reason, you're alienated from your current OS. If it's Windows, it's probably doing updates. And if it's Mac, it's probably just gotten kind of sluggish and slow as it's gotten older in time. And you don't feel like plopping down another couple thousand dollars to upgrade it. Both completely uh, understandable gripes. But at the same time, I'm not here to just say Linux is the most perfect operating system ever they all have their pros and cons and i wanted to go over basically on linux what to expect so right out of the gate don't expect a smooth transition linux is unlike any other operating system you've ever been on and switching over to linux desktop is a jarring one so i highly recommend dual booting to start out with and when you dual boot i always get the question do i just uh, use one hard drive and partition it off or should i use two hard drives and the answer to this question is always two hard drives if you can because sometimes like windows let's say you do an update uh it could wipe that you know uh partition out or or make it hidden to where you can't boot back into linux all kinds of bad things can happen when you have it all on one hard drive. Not to say it can't be done, just know that you are taking a risk when you only do one hard drive. So the second thing I wanted to go over is, well, what to expect when it comes to your basic Windows programs. Now, some people say Photoshop and Microsoft Office work okay in Linux, and this is kind of um, a half-truth. Older versions can be compatible, but it's not a very cohesive experience. It doesn't feel very good, and you'll end up just going right back to Windows if you think that Photoshop and your Office Suite will work how you want it to, for it to work. So I want to go ahead and just get that out of the way because I had a bunch of ambitions when I first switched to Linux about some of those Windows programs, and I was just very disappointed over just the lackluster things when I finally did get it working. And it's something that I just wanted to spell right now. So if you're really big into Adobe, you have Microsoft Office, uh, and you absolutely are using these day in and day out for hours at a time, Linux desktop's probably not going to be for you. And there's some caveats to that. I have an upcoming video about how an entire business could transition when still using Microsoft Office in the Adobe suite, but uh, that's not this video. And, and right now, if you're you're just a one person shop and you want to switch to Linux and you use these programs exclusively, you're going to have a hard time. Now, next up is going to be program installation. This is a little bit of a weird experience coming from Windows. Windows, you're used to going out to the web, going to whatever site it is, like whether it's Adobe, whether it's uh, uh, whatever manufacturer software you're trying to get from. You download an executable, you run this setup, and then it installs it all across your Windows system. Uh, Mac, it, it's a lot of the same way, although they do have an app store and some other things to install. And, and Windows does have chocolatey and some other aspects of Linux, but by no means is that its center point. Most people are used to doing this type of method of install when it comes to Windows and coming to Linux, it can be a little bit different. So um, just as an example, installing a program in Windows compared to installing the same program in Linux. And I'm going to go ahead and flip the desktop and show you that real fast. 
So as a quick demonstration of what it looks like to install a typical program, you'd go to the program's website. I'm downloading Sync Thing. We'd go to its download page, which I want to download this Sync Tray for Sync Thing, which is, Sync Thing's a great program if you haven't ever used it. You can sync pretty much anything to anywhere on any device. So very powerful. You come down to the executable file. We need x64 because we're on a 64-bit system. We download this executable. We open the executable by clicking it. It'll launch in. We'll go ahead and accept the agreement. Next. Specify the download location. Next. Say, okay, yep, put it in that start menu folder. And we can go ahead and create a desktop shortcut or not. Hit next. And then install. This goes through and installs the program, makes any registry files if the, your program needs the registry files, installs it to the location. Sometimes it installs at other places like uh, program data and other aspects in the Windows system, but uh, this is it. So it installs and ready to go. So we'll go ahead and hit finish and it launches into the program. So rather simple, um, very easy, and we'll go ahead and we're done. So on my Linux box here, I actually don't have everything installed for a remote software called Remina. You can use it to RDP into Windows systems and uh, VNC and all this all combined into one nice little app. Um, so that's what we're gonna install today. You can do it a couple different ways. I'm gonna demonstrate two different ways to install a program. The first is the easy way that I mentioned that, hey, you just go to the software center, load it up and click install. So let's go ahead and do that. And you'll see this up here. It gives you like little screenshots. It has little browse features as most app stores do. And you'd click install and you can search for apps too and find them this way. So very simplistic, easy way to install a program. And I'll go ahead and hit install here and let's see what happens. And then it's installed and we can just hit launch. So there it is. Very, very easy very quick to install using this method. However, I mentioned some programs aren't on there and you need to use terminal. What does that look like? Uh, let's say a obscure program wasn't on there and you wanted to install it. We'll go ahead and install it just through here. So we'll go sudo dnf install. Now this is like when you know what program you want to install. This is why I prefer the terminal. As you see, there's just less fuss. Or I just hit one hotkey, pull it up, say, hey, install this program, and it installs it. So while this looks like I'm hacking the matrix, it is, you're giving way too much credit where it's not due. This is just a very simple command. Uh, and any Linux distribution has that uh, sudo, which says, hey, run this as root or super user. And then the package manager, it can be DNF, it can be APT, depending on what distribution you go with, this portion can change a little bit. And then finally, install space, and then the program's name. And it installs it. It's pretty stinking simple, very fast, and I absolutely love it. So that gets us into why you would use Linux Desktop. And really, it's because it's very clean. Once you set it up and you get it set exactly how you want it and you get your workflows down, my goodness, Linux desktop is so fast and it makes you more efficient and productive. Uh, most people are always commenting how I'm able to get literally almost a YouTube video out every single day for over 400 days now. That's pretty insane, but I attribute most of that efficiency to using Linux desktop with Windows. There's a lot of things that would go into it and, and I, I struggled immensely when I first started the channel because my workflows in Windows just aren't as clean as it is in Linux. On Linux, I have one system inside that I hardly ever touch or do updates or do anything on and I just fly through and I just know every time I sit down at that, I can just go and do my work. And that's probably the biggest selling point to Linux that I see as I wouldn't be where I am at today without Linux desktop. So uh, that's one of the big, big parts of it that you can expect after you establish workflows. And what I mean by workflows is how you do and, and use your computer on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and workflows from Windows to Linux are very different. Like I, I showed a video showcasing, I'll, I'll link it up in the, the title card here, uh, going over the differences between like Adobe Photoshop, my workflow of doing like a thumbnail there and using GIMP, the, the 
Linux equivalent and making a thumbnail over here. And you can kind of see the different workflows and they're very, very different. So uh, this is just one example, but when it comes to video production, when it comes to all these other things, they're just very different from uh, one OS to the other. So that's one thing I will also say is don't expect or try and use Linux desktop like you use Windows. Be open for this change. Be open for establishing a new workflow. Now, one negative, now that I've given you a positive to Linux desktop or those first 30 days is audio is a little tricky. Uh, audio is not exactly fun in Linux a lot of times. It's, it's definitely, I would say, a low spot. And it's not to say audio doesn't work. It does work. It's just, it, it doesn't have that granularity or that real precise uh, cleanness to it uh, when it comes to the overall interface. It feels a little clunky. Uh, I mean this like you can set your audio volumes differently depending on the app. You can set your audio sources differently depending on the app. And you can set your overall one and it, it doesn't carry over a lot of times between all of your settings. So sometimes I'll open up Chrome and forget that I made a custom setting and, and put that to my headphones instead of the overhead speakers. And that can cause some issues. So know that the audio is a little funky when it comes to Linux desktop. The other thing I'll mention here too is printing and scanning support is hit and miss. Depending on your printer that you have, uh, sometimes this can be there and it's fine. But other times uh, a lot of printers have proprietary programs to control the scanning and printing and it doesn't come out as a very good or if you can't sometimes you can't even get it working so uh, verify that your printer and scanner if you're using a lot of these mfps or multifunction printers out there know that you might lose some functionality i've never not been able to get the printing to work uh, but sometimes i find the scanning doesn't work all that well now, when it comes to gaming on Linux, those first 30 days, this was probably the biggest highlight because if you install Steam and you have a huge Steam library, you'll find a lot of these games play and some of them just play awesome, even better than Windows in some instances. So gaming is probably a huge highlight for, for Linux for me. It was an unexpected one as the last year has gone on. I've literally gotten almost every single game I play working on Linux, which is pretty amazing. There's still some holdouts like easy anti-cheat and things like that, like uh, PUBG, Fortnite, uh, Apex Legends. Some of these games don't play on Linux because of the anti-cheat system, but this is actively being worked on and I think that'll be solved here in the next year. So it really is something that I know a lot of the community has been pushing towards and I'd be shocked if by uh, next year we, we don't see something. Now in that same gaming realm, it's not all perfect either. So I don't wanna give the wrong impression here. There's some launchers that just are a little finicky. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And I'm gonna go with like the off-brand launchers. So if you're really heavily invested in one of these launchers, you may look up on like ProtonDB's, the Steam site. So if you're worried about your Steam games, go to ProtonDB.com, but also look at Lutris.net and look up your games that you use to make sure that it works fine. Just to rattle a few off here, Bethesda Launcher, Origin, Uplay, Epic Launcher, depending on the games you have in here, they may or may not run on Linux. Uh, this is one of those things that is a little tricky. And, and if you have a huge library in one of these, I would probably hold off on switching to it on your gaming machine or at the very least dual boot uh, so you can play some of these games because I've had games I've gotten working in like, let's say Origin. I remember I was playing Anthem a little bit on my Linux box and then uh, an Origin update happened and it just messed this entire uh, system up I had going for that specific game, which that game kind of sucked. So it was kind of doing me a favor, but still you get the point that uh, you need to be wary if you have a huge library in one of these off-brand launchers. And then finally, when it comes to my first 30 days in Linux and you look at the desktop, this is one of the things I think is so normal when you first jump on Linux, you look at all these distributions that Linux has, and you're like, oh, I like the way that looks, or I like the way this looks. Just know, no matter which one you settle on, you can change the look and feel of Linux 
to be basically whatever you want it to be. So it's a really a very, very powerful and cool thing. So uh, be looking at this. It's something that I just absolutely love about Linux. The customizability, you just have endless options. And uh, definitely uh, on the same side of that, it's a double-edged sword. There's so many options that it can get a little confusing. And that's why I made a lot of video going over the Linux desktop environment how to change it out, the different kinds of desktops, the different kinds that you can go to, to really help you uh, kind of adopt and figure out maybe which one you want to start with. Because it's never, you're not going to pick the perfect, perfect one right out of the gate. I know I didn't. But at the same time, I wanted to at least kind of give you uh, an idea of what to expect when it comes to look and feel. There's so too many times people go in like, ah, this just feels weird, or I don't like the way this works. And they go back to Windows uh, because of that. And, and just know that you can change that to whatever you want. It's just a matter of finding that option that works for you. But that's going to do it for today's video. I just wanted to make this first 30 days to kind of temper expectations and kind of give you a, a feel for maybe what Linux desktop could do for you. And also to also say it's not a perfect solution. There's some instances where this could be just a complete train wreck for you and maybe head off some of that uh, by kind of telling you what to expect. Uh, but anyways, that's what I wanted to do in today's video. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. As always, thank you to everyone that supports this channel. Without you, I couldn't make videos like this one. And I'll see you on the next one.